everyone and welcome to this week's COVID-19 office hours. Um, glad to have you here today and just going to take a very brief moment to go over some tech notes before we get to the great team we've got today. So first and foremost, just a reminder that we will uh, be recording, excuse me, we are recording the webinar today and we will post a copy of that recording along with the slides and the content from the chat on the HUD exchange. Um, just do, please do give the team a couple business days to do so and we'll get those materials posted for you. Additionally, if you have any audio issues during the course of the webinar, we encourage you to switch over from computer audio to phone as that tends to be a little bit clearer. And you can make that switch at any time just by dialing the numbers that are both up there on the screen and that just were typed into the chat box for us. Additionally, all participants are gonna remain muted for the duration of the office hours today, but we anticipate and hope to hear from you throughout through the chat feature. So, um, Please look at the bottom of your screen all the way over towards the right you'll see the word chat and then what looks just like a message bubble if you click on that it'll open up the chat functionality for you please send all questions comments feedback thoughts in through the chat feature and when you do that just take a brief moment to make sure that those messages get sent to everyone it should default to that but if it doesn't just take a moment to scroll down we'll also do as we have done in several weeks past um, another poll question today so I'm gonna turn things over to Norm to both introduce the team and talk a little more about the content for today. Norm. Thank you very much, Natalie, and welcome everyone to the office hours session today. Uh, so I wanna introduce our uh, presenters very quickly. So you will be hearing from uh, several people from the SNAPS office, including myself uh, and Sharon Singer. We also have uh, Lisa Kaufman and uh, Brett Esters who are gonna be behind the scenes helping to answer your questions. Uh, we have a great presentation uh, on some of our uh, new technical assistance material from Ashley Kerr. Uh, we have a great presentation we're very excited about uh, from Margot Cushell, for, uh, the director of UCSF's Benioff Homelessness and Housing Initiative. Uh, we're very excited about that. We will also get our regular uh, Centers for Disease Control uh, and Prevention update from Ashley Meehan. Uh, and uh, we have a presentation on, um, on shallow rent subsidies from John Kuhn from uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, and we will get uh, our update on uh, COVID, uh, sorry, on ESG CV uh, grants uh, from Sharon Singer a little later on. So before we get into our speakers, uh, I want to just uh, mention a couple things. Uh, we have a poll question. Uh, so we're going to uh, put that in the chat window right now. Uh, and we encourage you guys to fill out the poll question. Uh, it's about uh, the steps you're taking to help prevent the spread of COVID. So you can type, you can just click on that link uh, that's in the chat window anytime during the session. Uh, we will talk about the results closer to the end of our session today. Um, I do want to mention we have, we do not have uh, anybody who can specifically answer EHV, emergency housing voucher questions today, but if you do want to give us your questions, we will be happy to uh, forward them and we can cover them either in, a, in an FAQ later on or cover them in a future office hours session. Uh, but we, we likely won't be able to answer those questions live today. Um, also want to uh, mention, most of you probably noticed, uh, we published a NOFA, sorry, a NOFO, uh, Notice of Funding Opportunity, earlier this week for the Continuum of Care program. Uh, we won't be talking in, uh, uh, much about that today. I do wanna mention that we will have a webinar uh, later on. We have not announced it yet, but if you are signed up for our listservs, uh, you will definitely get notification of that as soon as we have, um, as soon as we have uh, announced and, and gotten all the logistics together on that. So that shouldn't be too far away. So with that, I wanna turn things over to uh, the Benioff Center's Margot Cushel uh, and uh, let her take the agenda from here. Margot. Great, thank you so much, Norm, and thanks uh, for having me. Um, I wanna talk um, a little bit about the lessons that we learned from um, partnering with a variety of community partners to do large-scale mobile vaccinations for COVID-19. For those experiencing homelessness or those formerly homeless people living in um, SROs and permanent supportive housing and the like. Next slide. 
So um, very briefly, um, the UCSF Benny Affen uh, Homelessness and Housing Initiative is a research and policy center at UCSF where we focus on homelessness, housing, and health. Um, and uh, we do strategic science, which is that we take the questions that come from the community and try to find quick answers to them. We've been lucky to get very involved in the COVID response as well. Next slide. Um, I want to talk a bit, as I said, about COVID vaccinations and what we learned. A lot of what I wrote here is actually in a thread on my Twitter feed, um, which you're welcome to follow me at and Michelle. Um, for us, um, the Department of Public Health um, asked BHI to um, get involved, and we actually, for a number of months, took over the COVID uh, vaccine response in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco. If anyone knows San Francisco, that is the area of town with the largest uh, concentration of people experiencing homelessness, homeless services, permanent supportive housing, and the like. Um, to do so, we partnered with Code Tenderloin, which is an incredible um, uh, community-based organization made up of people with lived expertise of homelessness or incarceration who do job training and job work with Glide, um, which is a very trusted community-based organization um, that is a leader in homelessness, with a, a San Francisco Community Health Center and FQHC, and with a consortium of um, Bay Area Life Sciences Corporations who provided philanthropic dollars, as well as with the health department. We did this to provide vaccines to those living in the Tenderloin District. Next slide. Um, we um, took our idea, you know, our founding principle was that access is actually a much more important issue than hesitancy, or as I like to say, confidence, that um, we talk a lot about hesitancy or low confidence, but particularly with people experiencing homelessness, I think we need to flip it on its head and really talk about access. And when we talk about access to this population, we mean access, bringing the vaccine exactly to who they are. To do this, we started with originally one day and then one and a half days a week of pop-up sites in the Tenderloin. You can see one of these sites in front of Glide. These were no barrier. People could walk up at any time we were open, no appointments, no insurance, no identification, really nothing necessary. We also did special events on certain weeks and sometimes in evenings for targeted towards certain populations where we, um, where we did special outreach to populations. At all of our events, Whenever the J&J &J vaccine was available, because it went on pause for a short while, we offered both the J&J &J vaccine as well as one of the two mRNA vaccines. Next slide. Um, so why and how did these low barrier sites work? We used trauma-informed principles. We were really no barrier. Walk up, no insurance, no ID. And um, Code Tenderloin and other outreach workers from the FQHCs would walk the blocks in the days uh, before and during events, knock on doors in SROs and PSH, um, walk up to people on street corners and advertise the events, surface questions, and encourage people to come. During the event, they went out and actually brought folks to us, and we offered everyone who got vaccinated a gift bag, which included acetaminophen and ibuprofen to help people with any symptoms, socks, Gatorade, protein bars, and a few other goodies. Next slide. Um, how did the event work? Um, we used portable Wi-Fi and tablets and had either volunteers or at times guide staff register people on the spot. We used a web-based freestanding program run by an organization called Primary Health that did all reporting and record keeping. We did not try to integrate it into Epic, but we reported everything to the California State Vaccine Registry. We had volunteer clinician screen participants in one tent and offer informed consent and decide on what vaccine people wanted. We had a separate tent where a pharmacist or a nurse drew up vaccines so the vaccinators didn't have to pause to do that. And we had separate vaccination tents for J&J &J and the mRNA vaccine. And then people would go to an observation tent where they would be observed by a clinician for either their 15 or 30 minute time and given their gift bag, answered questions, given information about side effects of the vaccines and the like. Next slide. These worked pretty well. And in the first few weeks, we would have hundreds of people show up. 
But after a few weeks, we realized we had sort of hit their peak and we went a little rogue and did what we had wanted to do the whole time, which was send out mobile teams to actually vaccinate people wherever they were. And when I say wherever, I mean wherever. We vaccinated on sidewalks, we vaccinated in lobbies of SROs, we vaccinated in parks, we vaccinated in cannabis shops, we vaccinated in bodegas, restaurants, wherever people were, we vaccinated them. The teams had one to two co-tenderloin guides, two medical providers who were the vaccinators, two volunteer scribes who walked around with the Wi-Fi enabled tablets and some portable Wi-Fi hotspots. Each mobile team we found up until today in three and a half hours, generally they could do 10 to 25 vaccines. Now this seems not that efficient compared to max vaccine sites, but these are really people who otherwise would not get vaccinated. And I like to compare it to how much attention and time it would take to treat people with COVID. This is much more efficient. We found when we had four teams, they didn't uh, feed off each other, four teams would each do between 10 and 25. And in fact, usually the mobile site would do about 10 to 25 and each of the mobile, the, the stationary site would do that as many as each of the mobile teams. We would keep the stationary site as a home base. And one point person on Saturdays, this was me who would coordinate. We all had um, walkie talkies on us. Each team had one to two walkie talkies and uh, we would talk through the whole thing, get more vaccine out to people, answer questions and the like. Next slide. So what we carried, the teams, and this is one of the teams about to launch off. You can see that we had those sites, free COVID-19 vaccines and a little um, portable cart um, on wheels, as well as a go bag of the medicines and stuff. Each team carried five vaccines at a time, gift bags, Narcan, Epi and Albuterol, signage and, and health information. Next slide. Um, what we did and didn't do, we didn't shame anyone. We view confidence as something you build over time. And one of the best strategies we have was that we would vaccinate one person in a group and they would become our evangelist. It became really a community event where whoever took it would wind up telling everyone, oh, this isn't so bad. And we would find we would get people. If we didn't get them one week, we came back to them the next time we were out. We never shamed anyone for their decision. We never coerced. We answered all questions. And I'll speak about this in a second. We respected choice and autonomy. We gave people information about both types of vaccines and gave people their choice. I will tell you, almost everyone chose a J&J &J vaccines. People's hands. Sometimes we were observing them in their 15 minute period and they would choose to use drugs and we sat there with them because what we were trying to do was meet people where they were at. As I said, we went wherever we needed to go. Stores, restaurants, treatment programs, parole offices, SROs, street corners, encampments, parks, wherever we found people, we vaccinated them. Next slide. What was our secret sauce? Our secret sauce 100% was Code Tenderloin. And I wanna be clear that it was Code Tenderloin who really ran the mobile efforts. We as healthcare providers saw ourselves as secondary to them. They are nonprofit uh, training program and job opportunities for people with lived expertise. We paid them for their work, of course. They did prep work and prepared maps where people were. So they would be out in the community and say, hey, we think this street corner is gonna be a good place to go on Saturday or on Thursdays. They made arrangements with shopkeepers who said, come into my shop and vaccinate everyone working here or vaccinate the people who are coming in. Programs, we went to some drug treatment programs and others where people had not access to vaccines. They surfaced questions for us. They were incredible and they, um, we talked to them multiple times a week and they would bring forward questions that we as healthcare providers would answer and they would bring back to the field. I have HIV, can I still be vaccinated? What if I missed my second vaccine? I was supposed to get it four weeks ago. Can I still get the second one? And likewise, they were really in charge and we as healthcare providers and the non-clinical volunteers were there to support them. Next slide. Our principles, um, we drew from uh, this piece that I wrote with Barb DiPietro and Bobby Watts in the BMJ earlier this year. Our principles were very strong, commit to being trustworthy. We said what we could do. We never lied. We didn't exaggerate it. We anticipated side effects. If we ran out of vaccines, we told people we did everything we could to be as trustworthy as possible. We ensured equitable access and we really tailored our approach week by week, day to day. We changed what we did to meet the needs of the people who were there. Next slide. 
Um, these were um, some of our incredible community partners who made it happen um, with about one day a week for about two or three months and an additional half day a week for about six weeks. We did 2,500 vaccines or 2,500 people we vaccinated who otherwise were qu quite sure would not have been vaccinated. The effort is continuing. Next slide. Just before I step off and take questions, I just wanted to mention one more thing just to make you available of another resource, which was um, uh, earlier this year, um, right before Christmas, the California testing task force called me and said they had all these by next now um, tests, these rapid tests. They had not been used. How could we get them used? We um, iterated and basically set up a testing program in San Francisco shelters and then kept iterating to make it as low um, tech and as low number of people needed as useful. We developed a toolkit for a while. It seemed less important as California, the um, infection waned for a while. Now, as Delta is rearing up, it seems more relevant again. I just like to welcome anyone who would like to to download um, the, um, the toolkit and feel free to reach out to us with questions. We would love to support you um, doing rapid testing in shelters if that's what you'd like to do. Um, and so next slide. This is my contact information, my Twitter feed, and if there's time, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Margot. Uh, first of all, let me put in a plug for your Twitter feed. I'm an avid follower and you always <laughs> have great stuff. So I uh, strongly encourage uh, the Twitter users out there to, to sign up. Um, so I wanted to ask you a couple questions. You mentioned uh, you you bring out uh, both the j and and the mRNA vaccines. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, that's actually like, that's logistically very challenging. Yeah. Uh, and I know yeah. some of the, some of the partners we work with have, have struggled with that because they want to give people yeah. choices, but then like, it's so much harder to pull off. Do you, can you yeah. share your thoughts about what the trade-off looks like there? If, if, if almost everybody wanted J and J or how, how did you think about that? And do you have any reflections on that? Yeah, we really struggled with this because it certainly made things a lot more logistically complex. Um, we felt like we could pull it off, so we chose to, although I will tell you that particularly in the mobile vaccines, if we did 100 mobile vaccines in a half day or, you know, or in a sort of half day, full day, whatever we did, maybe three or four would be the mRNA. Um, but so I think if you needed to choose, I would probably go with that. We feel like the evidence shows if you're only going to get one. You're probably pretty clearly better off just doing the J and J if you're only going to get one, um, because we did we did our mobile. You know, we really felt like these pop ups were not that efficient in that like one mobile team could do as many vaccines as a whole pop up, but the pop up site really made the mobile vaccine program work. In that at the pop up, we would have either the pharmacist or the nurse drawing vaccines. We would send the team out. I will tell you with five J and J. At the pop-up sites, the people who walked into the pop-up sites more evenly chose the mRNA and the J and J. And I sort of feel like the people who are able to get to a place may be the people who actually feel like they could come back for another one. And we frankly felt more confident that they could come back. Um, because we did that, it was a little more logistically difficult, but we did things like we had two different tents with two different colors. We had one clinician doing informed consent and screening at the pop-up, and they would just put a sticker on someone if they went to the red tent or the orange tent you know, the J and J or the mRNA tent. And we sent the teams out with um, J and J, but if they ran into someone who needed the, or wanted the mRNA or missed a second dose, they would just radio back to us and we would send a runner. So we had someone whose only job it was, was to run vaccines out to the team because Sometimes they would go for two hours and not find anyone, and we didn't want vaccines to expire. So we basically had these folks running through the tenderloin, bringing vaccines out to the team. And so the only problem was generally people would then have to wait for five or 10 minutes for us to get the vaccine out to them. But we felt like it was, if you can do it, it felt worthwhile because some people had strong feelings about what they wanted and we wanted to honor that. I think if you can't do it, at least we found in San Francisco that the um, homeless population really chose a J and J. Thank you. And I, I also wanted to ask about something else you mentioned, which is the sort of the dynamic of people who would receive the vaccines then becoming sort of motivators yeah. for others to receive. Yeah. So can you talk about like, did you, was there anything intentional you did to sort of facilitate that or support that? Or, or is that just something that does just fine on its own without any sort of little nudging or, or whatever from you? 
I think a little bit of both. And I think, to be honest, there were two reasons why the mobile vaccine worked so much better. One was people didn't even have to walk two blocks. They didn't have to leave their tent. They didn't have to go. But the other thing was this community factor. It really felt like wildfire. All we needed was one person in group to tip, and they just sort of talked it up. So we would sometimes say, hey, how was that for you? Or, you know, do you have anything to share? And people really spontaneously shared. We did a few things when we saw that that worked, which is we created big stickers which said, I got vaxxed in the TL, and we asked people if they would wear them, and people did. It was sort of became like, it was sort of like an I voted sticker, but much, much bigger, and we all wore them, and people put them on, and we felt like once we realized how powerful the inter-conversations were between people, a lot of people sort of said, hey, I'll watch you do it, and if you do okay, I'll do it. I will say one other thing we, one other innovation we did is it takes about, it would take us about eight or nine minutes to register people, because the state of California needed quite a bit of information on them and there are a whole bunch of questions you have to answer. We also wanted to know if people were homeless or SROs or dwellers or non-homeless just for our own records. We actually flipped the script in the mobile um, campaign, which I forgot to say is that we would basically ask a few medical questions first. As soon as a healthcare provider, the nurse or physician felt comfortable vaccinating, we would actually vaccinate and then use the 15 or 30 minute waiting period for them to fill out the rest of the questions. And that made people less edgy because we were able, as soon as they said yes, we did it. Um, but often in that time, because there's this built in 15 minute period where you have to observe people, there was a lot of chatter that happened. And so it happened pretty organically, but we did what we could to sort of, you know, beef up the conversation and really CoTL was so instrumental in this. That's great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you Margo's for having me stick around for, for a couple minutes to answer chat questions. Uh, so if you have some, ask them very quickly, uh, but thank you so much. Great presentation, uh, great stuff. And uh, again, we uh, definitely admire your work on this. Thanks um, for having so we're me. Gonna, we're gonna switch gears now. Uh, we're gonna uh, turn things over to Ashley Meehan from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And she's going to give us our COVID update. Uh, Ashley. Thanks, Norm. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. This is Ashley Meehan with CDC's Homelessness Unit within our COVID-19 response. Next slide, please. So, uh, like every week, we present our county tracker that shows community transmission, um, and we continue to see progressively more and more red counties, which is um, not where we would want things to be heading. Um, so just as a quick heads up, this is likely all due to um, the increased spread of the Delta variant. Um, so is concerning and uh, just wanna make everyone alert that they are most likely in a substantial or high transmission area at this point in time. Next slide, please. I uh, also just wanted to show um, our forecast. Um, so this is also on our CDC COVID data tracker. Um, we have teams that combine a bunch of different models from different research centers um, to predict an estimated uh, four week out curve or um, uh, just case counts in the next four weeks. Um, so this is what we're looking at. So uh, likely not at the peak of Delta yet. Um, so again, this is only four weeks out and it changes as we get new data. Um, but just wanted to draw everyone's attention to that. Next slide, please. Um, and then this really shows um, how quickly Delta has um, taken, taken over um, the proportion of COVID cases that we're seeing. So that kind of medium orange that we see really getting bigger over the last few weeks since about May, um, you see that now is the predominant strain that is circulating in the US. Um, and it's possible that's going to continue to change, but um, just wanted to show how rapidly Delta has taken over um, the predominant uh, COVID cases. Next slide, please. And so this leads us to a handful of MMWRs that came out this week, um, each describing vaccine effectiveness. Um, and so there's one in particular that I think is really relevant for this group, um, and it was in uh, nursing homes and skilled care facilities. Um, and, and the bottom line up front is that vaccine effectiveness is dropping. Um, so this specific MMWR analyzed data from these skilled nursing and long-term care facilities to evaluate that vaccine effectiveness, um, specifically with the two currently authorized mRNA vaccines. So that includes Pfizer and Moderna. So they looked at the time period um, before Delta, so 
March 1st to May 9th of 2021. And then during this most recent uh, Delta period, so June 21st to August 1st of 2021. So before Delta, the vaccine effectiveness for any COVID-19 infection, so asymptomatic or symptomatic, was 74.7% effective at pre preventing infection. When they looked at it during the Delta period, it dropped about 20% to 53.1% effectiveness. Um, so it is important to note that this study did not differentiate Delta versus other factors like decreasing or waning immunity. Um, and it's possible that there are other strains that are playing into this uh, statistic as well. Um, I think the biggest implication for this group um, really just highlights that congregate settings are still at risk for COVID-19, especially with Delta on the scene. Um, and with this decreasing vaccine effectiveness, I um, really just want to emphasize that the prevention strategies like masking, distancing, um, vaccination, as well as testing are in place. So even though the vaccine effectiveness is decreasing, we're still promoting vaccine as one of our best tools to prevent infection. Um, the vaccines are showing good numbers in terms of preventing hospitalizations and death. Um, and so we still want to promote the vaccine um, in that way. Next slide, please. All right, I will take any questions. Thank you, Ashley. I, I know there's been a lot of talk in the news about uh, about uh, booster shots, and uh, you know they've there's been discussion about booster shots for people who are immunocompromised, uh, and also just booster shots for the general population. Can you talk about where are we on that, and what should, how should, what should people expect on that front? Yeah, that's a great question, Norm. So the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, or ACIP, um, they are recommending a booster dose for people who are immunocompromised. Um, we do not yet know how that rollout will work. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure when facilities can start expecting those doses to come in. Um, they are currently evaluating if a booster will be needed for the general population, um, but nothing has been decided to my knowledge yet. Um, so stay tuned on that. Great, thank you very much. And thank you as always for the update. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see that curve turn around sometime soon. Um, but thank you so much. If you have any questions for Ashley, please uh, type them in the chat window uh, and we'll try to answer as many of your uh, questions as we can. Uh, so I want to turn to the next slide. I just want to talk about a new resource uh, that was just published by the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. Uh, we're going to put a link to that in the chat window, but um, this is a resource, as you can see, uh, about the Delta variant and five ways communities can protect people experiencing homelessness. Uh, and so the actual resource goes into a little more detail about these uh, and has great links to other resources that are out there. So if you want a sort of a nice, concise, uh, and focused, but uh, with a lot of information resource. Uh, this is, uh, I'd strongly recommend that one. And again, that, uh, uh, Letitia put that in the chat window already for us. Um, so thank you very much for that. So we're gonna go to our next uh, presentation. Hey everybody, this is Ashley Kerr. Really happy to be here to talk about the Vaccine Messaging Toolkit. And next slide, please. And the next. So despite the reality that over 600,000 Americans have died because of COVID-19 and the Delta variant is really wreaking havoc across the country, as you saw with the, the red map um, a few slides ago, there are still many individuals who remain hesitant to get vaccinated, or as Dr. Cushell said, uh, lack vaccine confidence. This does include people experiencing homelessness and the staff and teams that serve them. Next slide, please. So when vaccines are the solution, the thing that we need to think about more than anything is to uh, get that out, make it as accessible, available, and frequent as possible. And I'm gonna talk about that in the next few slides. So, Several months ago, HUD wanted to learn more about what people experiencing homelessness thought about the COVID-19 vaccine, specifically their thoughts and fears, 
and to get feedback on factual messages about the vaccine that could help build up confidence in those that were hesitant. Given HUD's interest in making the vaccine accessible and easily available to people experiencing homelessness, as well as to address hesitancy and build vaccine confidence among people who are experiencing homelessness, HUD commissioned the development of a vaccine messaging toolkit. And you can see here, there were three uh, particular things that we were looking for. Um, one was to identify the most useful messages that both staff and teams can use to really think about where people were getting their information and how they were getting their information, and then understanding why people were hesitant um, and maybe why they did not want to get the vaccine. Next slide, please. So we spoke to almost 350 people in four different cities and really tried to, uh, people who were living in shelters and those who were unsheltered. And the 350 people, or approximately 350 people, reflected multiple races and ethnicities, as well as, as, well as a range of ages, gender identity, and vaccination status. And so we had three different types of engagement strategies, one being a group discussion, really thinking about um, what kind of, and, and helping us to understand the communication strategies that would work, to think about word association. So what are words that we know um, can help build vaccine confidence? What are words that potentially um, throw a wrench in, in building vaccine confidence for folks? And then also putting out certain messages that, as I mentioned, were factual to see which ones resonated with people experiencing homelessness and those that did not. So the subsequent slides will provide additional details about the sample population and our, and our findings, um, which helped lead to the development of the toolkit, which we'll show in a few minutes. Next slide, please. So motivators and fears. So I think the main thing I'd like for folks to remember is that vaccine reluctance does not equate to vaccine refusal. So we spoke to a lot of folks that had lots of questions. Um, questions should always be normalized but that even if they had questions, they had gotten vaccinated or were planning to get vaccinated. So we, you know, the, the concern that everybody um, who expresses hesitancy will not get vaccinated is not a true statement. So we know that some of the motivators for the folks that we spoke with was that they experienced a lot of personal grief and loss from people, uh, family and friends that they had lost um, or who had been seriously affected by COVID-19. We knew that trusted staff and healthcare providers that were engaging actively with people experiencing homelessness was a real motivating factor in getting people to a yes for the vaccine. Uh, as Dr. Kishel pointed out, once you see one of your friends get vaccinated and everything's okay, it really helps allay some of your fears about getting vaccinated. And then making it as easy as possible. Um, and I love that Dr. Kishel talked about all the different places where she gave a dose to, to folks um, but if you think about it, making and, and allowing the dose to be wherever that person is, is the best way to get to a yes. And of course, the fears that, uh, that I'm showing here on the screen are nothing that you don't know about and things we have been hearing for many, many months now. The misinformation that vaccines contain live um, virus of COVID, that they cause fertility issues or sterility um, or other serious side effects. And then the, the big one, of course, right, that it was developed too quickly and there's just a lot we don't know. So those are the things that we heard. Those are some very common um, fears that the individuals that we spoke with talked about. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about who the trusted sources of information are. We learned, um, and it really varies. So this, you know, when we're talking about vaccine, building vaccine confidence now, this is really about one-on-one -on -one conversations with individuals. And so every individual is gonna be different. And for some, speaking to a doctor or nurse is a trusted source of information. For others, it's homeless clinic staff or people who are working in the shelters or, out or street outreach teams. And sometimes it's healthcare for the homeless. So you really need to think about who can provide factual answers um, to really good questions that people are asking and to make those folks as available as possible so that if those questions are there, um, that folks get their answers as quickly as possible. I will say a couple of things. In the absence of information, people go and seek it out themselves. So that is where we have seen a lot of misinformation in social media. And while the individuals we spoke with said that they did not trust social media, they were still looking at it constantly. And so we just have to think about who, or let's just say what sources of information people are seeing on a regular basis and what kind of messages those are bringing across. 
you can see on the right side some of the other information sources that people felt were trustworthy, including CDC and Dr. Fauci. I think most people here love Dr. Fauci uh, and his ongoing conversations with the United States, but local TV news, national news, um, and then family and friends, aside from the social media piece. Next slide, please. So when we talk about the messages that we utilized and tried to um, see which ones resonated most with folks, we noticed that people did not express concerns really over the effectiveness of one vaccine over another, but that they were really interested in messages that talked about keeping um, themselves and others safe, protecting friends and family, and bringing an end to the pandemic. What we also learned was that when we use terms, um, and I'll just use the term clinical trial, that brought up a lot of negative feelings. Um, and so we've learned that the messaging and the conversations that we need to have with individuals experiencing homelessness and the staff and teams that work with them are to really kind of uh, to avoid those industry terms and to just talk um, and have very accessible messaging. Next slide, please. So I really encourage folks to use the three messages that are on the screen. Um, and as you know, you can get this uh, presentation in a couple of days, but these are the three messages that resonated the most with individuals. And as you can see, this is really, all three of these messages are focused on safety and responsibility. So as a part of this community, I'm getting vaccinated to protect myself and others from serious illness or death. I'm getting vaccinated to keep myself and my friends and family safe. And then vaccines will help bring this end or bring an end to this pandemic. So these three messages we know worked incredibly well. Um, I encourage everyone to use these statements when you are having the one-on-one -on -one conversations with individuals that potentially are hesitant and may need to have their vaccine confidence built. Next slide, please. So the top three actions that we're really encouraging communities to engage with is to provide as many opportunities as possible for people to ask questions and receive information from familiar and trusted faces and sources. So if you have not started using vaccine ambassadors yet, please, uh, you're gonna have a job description at the end of the slide or at the end of this presentation, but go out and hire vaccine ambassadors. These peer educators can be incredibly uh, incredibly helpful in, in really pushing um, the positive messages and the factual messages about the COVID-19 vaccine. Also equip your staff with the type of messaging that we know works with people experiencing homelessness, and then making sure that people can have their questions answered. And I think it's really important here, if the staff or team does not have an answer, that is absolutely okay, but go to a trusted source, whether it's your healthcare for the homeless representative or another uh, clinical provider that can answer those questions and be able to provide those factual um, pieces of information for folks. And the last thing here I would just say is that we need to offer as many ac access points to vaccinations as possible. Um, this really helps increase access and opportunity for folks who wanna say yes, um, and it really helps reduce res uh, hesitancy. Next slide. So let's take a few minutes and talk about all things vaccine events and incentives, right? Um, there's lots of really great opportunities out there and sources to really come to a yes when we talk about the COVID-19 vaccine. So we know that incentives have always been one of the tools to support and encourage individuals to get vaccinated as along with all the things I just mentioned, trusted sources of information and easy uh, access to an actual vaccine. We also know um, that with the new, with the ESGC funds, you can pay for incentives. And I know there's been lots of questions in the chat and I know the SNAP um, folks have been answering them, but that means you can get $50 per dose. And of course, sometimes it's a one dose regimen, sometimes it's a two dose regimen, and there may be a three dose regimen coming up. Um, we'll, we'll be hearing that in the months and uh, days to come. I do wanna point out the caveat, right? That ESG funds can be used um, only to the extent that other vaccine incentives are inaccessible or unavailable um, in the community. Next slide, please. So there is not a one way to get vaccinated. And I'm just throwing out here that there's a variety of different types of events. We know about mass vaccination events when we're seeing thousands of people in cars lined up. There are ways to have vaccination events in congregate settings, such as shelters. There are ways to have it outdoors. Um, and as you saw from the pictures from Dr. Cushell, that does not involve a lot of very heavy infrastructure. That was three or four tents 
that you can set up on the side of an encampment or in a particular street where we know lots of folks are living unsheltered and just set up a couple tents, get some vials out there, get a couple of seats and go for it, right? There's, so we don't need to have extremely extensive planning here. Um, you just need to be able to get doses in arms. I wanna say, of course, now there's total availability, right? If somebody feels more comfortable going to a CVS, take that person to the CVS. If that person feels more comfortable getting that vaccine to come to their room um, in the shelter or uh, in the wherever they're living, take it to them. So think about how you can make this as accessible and available and frequent as possible for the folks that we're serving. And I just wanna say here, of course, you see the healthcare sites on the slide, but partner with your public health, healthcare for the homeless and SQHCs. Um, they are great partners in this to get the vaccine out to folks. Next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit about the components of vaccine events um, and what we think need to be a part of it. As I mentioned, you don't need to have a lot of things, but you do need to have a couple of pieces here. And I wanna say that we wanna start with the values of accessibility, um, availability, being trauma-informed and client-centered, and being frequent. So those are the values that we bring to all of these events. You wanna have a trusted person or people there to answer questions and help dispel myths and misinformation. If possible, you wanna have vaccine choice. So I love the fact that you uh, that in San Francisco, they could offer one of the mRNA vaccines or they could offer the J&J. &J. Um, that really puts the, again, onus and power um, in the hands of the client um, instead of in the hands of the people giving the vaccines. You want to have a data collector there um, if you're using HMIS so that you know if there's a second dose um, and you can record that information. You want to have incentives and then you want to have amenities. So Dr. Cushell talked about acetaminophen, uh, Gatorade, protein bars, have whatever the, the folks that you are serving need. And that's really where you talk to the folks that you are serving and what do they need? What would be helpful for them to have at a vaccine event um, that they could take with them? The things that I would put that are here in italics are, I think if you could have, this would be really great. If you could have a case manager or having housing navigator there to support permanent housing conversations. So you've got that 15 or 30 minute window after the dose where people are being observed. This is the time to have the conversation. Do you wanna move into permanent housing? Let's talk about what, you, what your goals and wants are and how I can get you to a yes to permanent housing. If possible, if you're working and you're providing uh, vaccinations to people who are living unsheltered, a storage area, if they're willing to, per, they're willing to um, put, their plate, put their belongings in a place that they can sort of have full access and vision on. Uh, showers, bathrooms, and laundry facilities for people who are living unsheltered. These are amenities that they do not have readily access to. And so we wanna um, provide additional amenities and incentives. And then if possible, being pet friendly. So if it's outdoors, and you are serving people who are living unsheltered, you wanna think about making sure that their pets can come with them for their dose. Next slide, please. Okay, um, vaccine toolkit. So we have lots of different components. There are more components forthcoming. This is all, and I think it's gonna be, oh good, Tisha's already putting it in the chat, so thank you. So there's a great video from Dr. Morris from the CDC that answers questions about COVID-19. You've got a several page document that talks about how to build staff confidence in COVID-19 vaccines. There is a great customizable flyer for frontline workers about talking to participants about the vaccine. And this is really geared for staff who may be vaccine hesitant. Even if people are vaccine hesitant, they can speak objectively and get uh, answers or questions, uh, answers to the questions that people experiencing homelessness have without putting in a subjective opinion there. So this, this flyer really helps speak to that. And then there's another customizable flyer for people experiencing homelessness of why you were given top priority to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, when I go out and talk to folks in shelters and people experiencing homelessness, I bring two flyers with me. This is one of them and this is on the vaccine page but addressing your concerns about the COVID-19 vaccine. It's a one pager, super easy to photocopy and pass out. Next one, please, next slide. And this one is great, common side effects. So this is something that you can take before and also give to people during the observation period. Hey, here are the side effects. These are very common, nothing to be concerned about. 
this is when you should be concerned, right? And when to call a doctor or 911. But again, a one pager, super easy to pass out and super accessible to read. Next slide. Additional resources. So there really are a ton of resources on the HUD exchange. We have vaccine conversation tips for homeless service providers. I just mentioned the addressing your concerns. We have a great uh, one pager about language that works to improve vaccine confidence. That is not one of our products. It's something that someone, uh, an expert who does lots of messaging and values-based messaging has put out for um, those of us to use. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the vaccine ambassador program and job description. So if you have not already um, hired vaccine ambassadors, please, please do that. You can use your ESG CV dollars to do that. And that is the way to help get the information out to people experiencing homelessness. Next slide, please. All right, I'm turning it back over to you, Norm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley. Great information. And uh, I'd strongly encourage people to really sort of keep reading and internalizing those uh, vaccine messages because we found that uh, I think it's, it's a very powerful way to uh, communicate with people and, and uh, very effective. So thank you so much for presenting all that. Just a ton of great information. I just want to remind everyone, we have all kinds of great stuff like this on the on the HUD exchange. Uh, just, you know, if you haven't been to the COVID-19 page recently, you should uh, just go take a look and we're posting new things all the time there. So thank you so much, Ashley. Uh, so we're going to turn to our next presentation now. I'm very happy to introduce John Kuhn from the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, great partner with HUD on uh, all things veteran homelessness. Uh, so I'm going to turn things over to John to talk about the SSVF shallow subsidies. John, turning Thanks it over so to you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, glad to be able to join you guys today. Uh, next slide, please. So just a quick review for those who may not be familiar with the SSVF shallow subsidies. Uh, these began uh, about two years ago, and they are a two-year fixed subsidy that provides 35% of rent reasonableness, or FMR. Um, it's up to the grantee. So the 35% has been in place uh, mostly on the West Coast, Chicago, DC, and New York, but in limited areas. Uh, the, uh, the expansion that's currently underway is going to take this national, hence uh, my, my presence on this call today. Uh, the, the idea behind the shallow subsidy is to provide a consistent level of support for people who don't have high levels of needs, particularly uh, for for those familiar with the veteran space, things like the HUD-VASH program, which provides services for those uh, who need intensive clinical care uh, and may need long-term subsidies through the, through the uh, vouchers that are available through HUD-VASH. The idea with the shallow subsidy is it's providing a greater level of affordability or bringing more apartments into affordability for people who frankly are just poor. They don't need high levels of service, um, they may need help, though, uh, trying to keep up with their, given that they're low income and, and the uh, cost of rents are, are greatly accelerating uh, beyond the reach of the folks who are low income. So these last for two years. Uh, during the two-year period, unlike most SSVF services, participants don't need to requalify. Typically during SSVF involvement, you have to prove income eligibility every 90 days. So during the two years, you get the subsidy regardless of what happens to your income. And this is meant uh, to incentivize income growth, particularly we have a strong relationship with Department of Labor, uh, the Department of Labor's HVRP program, and in many instances is co-enrolling participants in our shallow subsidy program with the idea is you're gonna use this two-year uh, subsidy to, be, to grow your income, so hopefully by the end of it, you're not constantly at risk for homelessness. One of the things we've certainly all experienced is that for many of our participants, even after their place in permanent housing, the severe rent burden they're under constantly puts them at risk, even if they're in permanent housing. So for, for those veterans who need a longer runway, if you will, to try to increase income, uh, it, it's an opportunity to do that and uh, get a consistent level of income support. There's a modest level of case management. We do require that at least 50% of the grant is used on rental support. Uh, rental support or other, mostly rental support, but other financial assistance can also be offered. Um, next slide, please. 
So there's two main areas where this support can be used. It's typically going to be a follow on to a rapid rehousing uh, placement or a uh, homeless prevention assistance. We think that with the veterans uh, and many others facing this eviction wave potentially with the end of the CDC moratoriums now slated for October, there's certainly ample resources through ERAP and SSVF, for instance, to try to cover arrears. The challenge becomes once those arrears are paid, what happens to veterans who still can't pay the rent? They don't have enough income. So this is an opportunity to supplement or follow on after these arrears are paid to help veterans stay in those households while they work to increase their income. The second group is going to be uh, for folks who are going to be in homeless in rapid rehousing rather than homeless prevention, which I just described, and rapid rehousing who again just need additional assistance following the more intensive and more tra sort of traditional rapid rehousing placement. And we we use this as a, a sort of progressive engagement where people may not ne need this uh, shallow subsidy, but for those who do um, and don't need the higher levels of support that are offered by something like HUD Vash, there is this shall subsidy offer. Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, there's a close coordination with the Department of Labor. We are really seeing this as an opportunity to build income. Uh, the Homeless Veterans Reintegration Program is probably the pre predominant uh, Department of Labor intervention that's working with uh, the shall subsidy, although there are other Department of Labor programs. And that's not to exclude those who, though, who are not really employment eligible. We do see a role here for those who are on fixed income but are facing higher rent burdens and their fixed income is not increasing fast enough to uh, keep up with that rent burn, this may be a, uh, an excellent intervention to help those folks who are um, uh, looking at, at increases they can't manage, bring that rent back into an affordability. Next slide, please. So this is my final slide, and, and this is really where the changes now are taking place. So we've already published in the Federal Register on August 5th, the national expansion of shallow subsidy, moving away from just this sort of coastal major city um, uh, initiative to every area that an SSVF grantee is located can now use these shallow subsidies. These shallow subsidies are going to be funded through fund through the uh, American Rescue Plan. There's $200 million available through that, and we expect that money to be released uh, about October 1. Uh, and those uh, grantees who are getting those additional funds have already been sent memorandums of agreement, so they are quite aware of their uh, uh, in, in their their awards and what they're uh, going to be able to uh, access to be able to support these placements. For those of you who want to see where those awards are going, uh, we will have information up on our website. Uh, if you Google SSVF, you can find it. It also lists all of our grantees as well. We also expect a new interim rule to be published in about the next 90 days, and this will increase the 2 year subsidy up to 50% of rental of rent reasonableness. This is important because we're finding in some communities, particularly the highest cost communities, the 35% is not sufficient. So, taking it up to 50% uh, will be important in certain high cost communities, although it will be a community decision as to what the maximum subsidy will be. There will be areas of the country where 50% is not necessary. It could be at a lower level. And of course, if it can be set at a lower level, you can serve more people. Uh, so it's it's going to be a, a decision that's made on, again on a community basis. We hope our grantees are reaching out uh, to the COC to, uh, to inform some of these decisions. It's not necessary for them to get a sign off or anything like that, but but we do certainly want an informed decision making process where all the resources in the community can be considered so that way we can begin to develop plans uh, in each community as how you're going to use this combination of resources through SSF, through HUDVASH and so forth uh, to end homelessness in that community. And this now becomes an important resource for that. So, with that, let me pause and see if there are any questions. Thank you, John, so much. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask was, so you talked about the level of the shell subsidy being 35% of either FMR or rent reasonable. Can you talk about, like, what is the thinking behind that level of assistance and sort of how you came to uh, 
to choose that level. So we actually based it on uh, the limited amount of literature that was available that recommended 35%. This was about two years ago, uh, actually more because we're writing the regs even earlier than that. And since that time, we have seen from particularly experience in California and, uh, and places in the West Coast that Seattle as well, that that rate of subsidy is simply uh, uh, too low to really make the difference for people who have such a, a wide gap and affordability. So we're taking up to 50%. Also what's allowed is that these um, subsidies can be combined with state or local resources. Can't be combined with other federal resources, but it can be combined with local resources. And we have heard of some communities that are either considering or uh, are actively working to increase that 50% or going to be 50% increasing now the 35% subsidy uh, with local funds. And uh, thank you so much. And can you talk about any other observations? I know you know it's the beginning, and and uh, you know we're not <laughs> we're not so far along yet. But can you talk about any other observations you've had about uh, how how it's working, or or just any sort of recommendations you have for communities as they seek to implement it? Well, certainly one of the most important things we found is that we needed to increase the rate of subsidy for these high cost communities. But there has been a uh, a widespread interest in this. We've been looking at ways to try to expand it nationally, and certainly the ARP has, has given us the resources to do it, uh, because there are many communities that we're all familiar with, everyone on this call, that housing affordability is, is not just the problem of major metropolitan areas, it, it's nationwide at this point. And there are many folks who don't need intensive clinical services. They simply need help with the rent um, and maybe some modest assistance. And that's really where this fits. So, uh, you know, given some of the experiences uh, people are starting to find, for instance, with like the universal income uh, and other kinds of assistance that doesn't require lots of services, but simply a transfer of resources to make ends meet, this is closer to that than I think some of our traditional programs. Great, thank you so much. And uh, someone in the chat window is commenting, we'd love this for all populations, not just veterans. I think we probably all agree <laughs> with that. So, uh, but uh, thank you so much for uh, like putting this out there and uh, showing us a model of how, you know, you can have that kind of universal benefit. Uh, thank you so much. If you have additional questions for John, uh, please feel free to type them in the chat window um, and, uh, you know, John or uh, others will try to answer as many of them as we can. Uh, with that, I want to switch gears to, I'm going to uh, turn things over to Sharon Singer and she's going to talk about uh, how we're doing on ESGCV grant spending and also uh, show us the result of our poll question. That means you, you got like 30 seconds to get your poll question uh, answered. So there is that link up there. Uh, so please go ahead and click it if you haven't already and, uh, and answer the question. Uh, but with that, I'm gonna turn things over to you, Sharon. Hey there, thanks. Hi everybody. Um, I'm here for our regular update on the ESGCB uh, grant activity. And um, we are definitely seeing things continue in the right direction. Um, I know that many of you received spending plans over the last couple of weeks and hopefully have been in touch with our office. Um, and uh, although we don't have a set deadline, if folks, uh, any sort of communication, if you are sort of lagging behind and are uh, unsure if you'll meet that 30, uh, September 30th deadline of 20%, um, please reach out. Um, we are eager to hear from you and eager to help. Um, so. We are at 17.5% uh, of awarded funds have been drawn. Um, and even just that, that was from Tuesday. Um, and that was even a big jump from Friday. So um, things are definitely moving up. And we appreciate that uh, folks are taking this uh, seriously and, and using the funds uh, well. So we also have most of the funds are awarded. We still have a few stragglers that we are working with um, to get those funds uh, in IDIS and um, and get the funds committed as well. Um, so we're we're definitely making progress. If you want to go to the next slide, you can see kind of where we we did have a, a nice big jump up kind of this summer. 
Um, and, and now we are at um, almost 700 million um, being drawn. Um, again, the, the deadline is for expenditures, um, which is what you guys need to report to us. Um, all that we can see through IDIS are the draws, but as you can see, we are definitely heading in the right direction and hope that individually the grantees will be at 20%, but it looks like we'll probably uh, as across the country be around 20% uh, come September 30th. So again, reach out if you need assistance or have questions uh, in getting in getting there. So um, I am going to switch gears and hopefully folks had time to fill out the poll. Um, and the question for this week is what uh, step does your community have in place right now to prevent COVID-19 spread? Um, and there were lots of choices um, and you can choose more than one. So it's check all that apply. Feel free to continue responding while I'm talking. Um, it's, it's good to hear your answers. Um, it, it looks like um, we have some really great uh, vaccine drives and shelters has been uh, the largest response with 21% of you. Um, also vaccine drives for unsheltered persons. Um, and just in general, 18%, we've got vaccine incentives. Um, so all of those are excellent um, ways to, to reach this population. Um, it looks like we also have um, increasing non-congregate uh, shelters at 13%. Um, regular testing in some shelters at 12%. Increasing vaccine ambassadors. I know we were, uh, Ashley was just talking about that today. Um, so that's a great, um, and, and also our, our friends from the Benioff Center. So um, that's a great opportunity as well. Um, and at much lower, we've got uh, mandating staff uh, who work with people experiencing homelessness are vaccinated and regular testing in all shelters. Um, so those were the, the lowest by far, but it's great to see that these vaccine drives um, are still happening and, um, we're still we're, we're still in this, so uh, thanks for all your hard work uh, in protecting people experiencing homelessness. All right, Norm, back to you. Thank you so much, Sharon, uh, and uh, thank you all for the um, the questions you have coming in. We have a lot of uh, questions related to the COC NOFA. I will say we do uh, uh, say again that we do plan on having a webinar just dedicated to the COC NOFA. Or sorry, no foe. Um, and we will, um, by the way, it wasn't our choice <laughs> to change the name, um, but we will uh, announce that webinar. So if you are not signed up for our listservs, I'd encourage you to do so. Uh, and um, and uh, you'll find out as soon as everyone else does. And we'd encourage you to join that. Uh, so I don't think we have any, uh, I think we've had a chance to answer most of the questions. Uh, that we um, that we are able to answer. Uh, if you want to know why it changed to NOFO, I would encourage you to join the webinar we are going to have on the COC NOFO. Um, so I think we've answered all the questions we can at this point. Uh, thank you everyone for submitting those. Uh, and actually I will sort of, there is sort of a question related uh, to expenditures. So Brett, uh, if I could, um, Sort of turn this over to you. The question is about the September 30th deadline, and uh, I know you answered it in the chat, but I, I think it's worth repeating. So, the the deadline was to to expend 20% by September 30th. Can you talk about exactly what has to happen by September 30th to meet that deadline, and what can happen after September 30th? Yep. Um, so. The deadline is for expenditures, uh, not draws. Obviously, we'll look in IDIS, and if you've met 20% draws, then you've met 20% expenditures. But if the cost has been incurred by September 30th, then that can be counted towards meeting the deadline. Um, if you're not going to meet the deadline, I recommend reaching out to your CARES Act desk officer. They've been in communication with you throughout um, the SGCV implementation. But if you don't know who they are, uh, you can shoot us a note through the AAQ. Um, 
but we'll be looking uh, if if you don't meet the expenditure deadline deadline, then there is a chance that we could recapture funds. But really, we'll be working with each of you individually, looking at your plans for using the funds. Do you have plans to pay rent with that money, for example? Um, but really, it's about costs incurred, not draws. You can draw after September 30th. Is there anything you'd add to that, Norm? No, I think that uh, summarizes it very nicely. Um, so thank you. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, I wanna again, thank all our presenters today. We had a great set of presentations. Uh, and again, wanna remind people that we just have a lot of great resources out there on the HUD Exchange. Uh, we do post these webinars afterwards. So if you wanna go back and view some of the old uh, oldies but goodies, uh, you are welcome to do that. Uh, and if you have any suggestions for uh, presenters or anything, uh, please feel free to either uh, type them in the chat window in one of these office hour sessions or just, you know, notify anyone at HUD that you happen to know about uh, things you'd like to hear about. Uh, I definitely want to thank um, all the people behind the scenes who work to make this, uh, this office hours webinar run really smoothly. We got a lot of people who are uh, out there just sort of making sure everything works fine. Uh, and I also wanna thank all of you who joined this webinar either you know, every couple weeks or, or uh, listen to the recordings uh, and take this information and really apply it to your communities. Uh, it is heartening to see that uh, everyone is sort of jointly uh, doing so much to uh, help protect people experiencing homelessness, to end homelessness uh, and to prevent the spread of COVID. We deeply appreciate your efforts. And again, the SNAPS office is just constantly amazed at the uh, incredible perseverance and, uh, and, and work that you all are doing. So thank you so much. Uh, with that, I wish everyone a great rest of the day, great weekend. And that concludes the webinar.